Well, thank you so much, Courtney and Rachel, for those provocative presentations and really an important dimension to what we need to be thinking about here during this conference. And um, thank you, Kathy and, and Joan. We're going to now move into the, um, the, the final portion of the workshop. And this is the interactive portion um, where we're going to be harvesting uh, the collective wisdom of all of you, all of the participants. We have quite a bit to, um, to, to draw from um, as we think about what we've been doing for the last two days. Um, we're going to use that, that approach we did yesterday with uh, pairing the mentees where the first one will sort of get the juices flowing, and get you to answer some, some quick questions, and then we'll move into, after that, we'll move into some open-ended questions. But before we do that, um, Adriana has just put something on the screen, which you saw yesterday, which is what topics are important to you? Has anything changed? Maybe you have a different view today uh, compared with where you uh, ranked these yesterday. So, so go back to menti.com and we'll be using that a bit now um, and use that code and you'll be able to rank these. Give it a few seconds. Okay, we're seeing some of the early returns here. What what topics are important to you and, and what's changed? Order of interest and importance. like oh, a couple of minutes but a couple of seconds uh, but it looks like the top two have been working with stakeholders and translating scientific information for decision making but let's let's give it another moment or two All right, so it looks like the, the top two have remained uh, translating scientific information for decision making um, and the working with stakeholders as what's most important to you. Um, and then uh, in the middle is capacity building and then the barriers and opportunities and dealing with uncertainty are a little bit lower down. But um, maybe Adriana, do you want to um, share with us the screen from yesterday so we can see a comparison? Yes, so here on the screen is what was um, yesterday. Oh. From the beginning of the session. Interesting, so one observation is that working with stakeholders was fourth on the list and now it's moved up uh, to, to pretty much the top. Dealing with uncertainty, I think, was near the bottom on both of them. Yes. Um, and uh, barriers and opportunities is now further down. Um, but translating scientific uh, information is still uh, one is still ranked up at the top. Thank you. Um, and something else to note that yesterday we had 87 uh, responses to um, that this mentee. So I'll switch back to the other one. We probably have a, a minute or two to wait so we can get some more feedback and more participation. Yeah, I guess we also have to recognize there may be some different people here today than we had yesterday. Oops. There we are. <sighs> okay, let's see if anything changed. Yeah, pretty much pretty much what it looked like when we left a, a minute ago. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you folks for telling us what's what's most important to you. And um, I think we need to move on. Uh, we're, we're now going to move to our first mentee pair, and um, it's on the topic of how well we're doing on achieving resilience. And this is um, this is that spider diagram we saw yesterday. Um, each axis represents an average of your inputs. So um, 
take a take a few seconds and we'll we'll see what emerges. You'll have a scale of one to five. Five is the strongest. Where do we stand on achieving resilient coastal wetlands in each of these five areas? And the way this works is um, just as a reminder uh, that the top the top score is five, the strongest, um, and um, it's easiest to look at the axis itself rather than the spread between the axes just to get a sense of so far it's looking like um, decision support tools. Um, looks like that's where we're strongest in achieving resilient coastal wetlands and communities. Um, but closing technical research gaps and capacity building and expertise are also close close to that as well. On the slightly lower side, we see political will and overcoming barriers to implementation. All right, this seems to be slowing down. I think that's about where we where we end up. So um, now that we've we've taken this poll. Um, we're going to have an open-ended question for you, um, uh, which Adrian will put on the screen in just a moment. So what are the top things that we need to do to improve as a community of practice to achieve resilient coastal wetlands and communities? So this is where you get to type in um, your thoughts. Um, we do want to see them on the screen and uh, on the Menti screen. Give you about 30 seconds just to think about it a little bit. Start typing. Jordan's just reminding everyone that you can type as many uh, responses as you want into the mentee for this one, for all the open ended ones. Seeing a number of things related to information sharing and working with communities, coordination, and uh, building capacity. We're seeing some more about relating to working together and relationships and education, uh, celebrating successes, which we we heard from some of our speakers, um, identify gaps. And I like that one, hold an annual workshop like this one.
And um, again, feel free to put more in the Menti. Um, if you want to amplify, you're welcome to do so in, in the chat. more about training and empowering community leaders um, and investing in adaptive management. Um, working together. Yeah, these are these are really wonderful responses, and this is exactly what we're looking for in this workshop, so it'll be important to have this this feedback for the proceeding summary. And now I think uh, Adriana, we should move to the next pair. Uh, the next mentee peer uh, relates to information needed to manage for resiliency. So the first one is, a, again, just a poll. Do you feel that information on managing for resilience is readily available and sufficient for success? Only three choices here, the simple one. Hmm. So we're, we're it looks like we're sort of not sure is the is the the, the highest one. Um, no is is thirty two and yes is a smaller amount. So this this the smallest grouping is feeling that information um, is available, but. More for thinking, we're not sure, and maybe no. Um, there may be new, more nuanced, and I see, actually I see in the chat the question is too narrow, which is, which is impelling me to suggest, Adriana, that we move on to the next one, which is more open-ended, um, open-ended prompt um, about what actions do we need to take to ensure that information on managing for resilience is readily available and sufficient for success. So what actions are needed with respect to information? Give me about 30 seconds or so to think about it. Hmm. Seeing a few themes emerge related to political support and outreach, funding, having something like a clearinghouse or a website, central source of information, peer to peer sharing. Let's give you another few moments to to add any additional ideas and and again, you can add as many as you want here. I'll scroll up briefly so folks can read at the, the top if they didn't. Maybe some items will uh, spur some ideas. Mm, thank you, Adriana. And, um, and Joan, if you do see something in the chat, just chime in. I will, Joe. I think people are concentrating on putting it all into this Menti, it looks like. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a fair amount about regional collaboration and and some way of bringing together resources. Like you kind of see right now on the screen is compiled resources, examples and case studies. Um, there's some more about political support, stakeholder support. Um, Clarity on pulling together the tools and resources. OK, well, I think it's I think it's kind of slowing down. So so Adriana um, probably makes sense to move on from here. Joe, there is a, a one com a question that just came up, <clears throat> which is how much do we need to modify regulations to permit new efforts to aid resilience? Would someone like to to address that from the either the panels or the or the or the um, leads for the conference. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I think in some cases regulations um, have inherent some inherent flexibilities that we if we look at them closely we can take advantage of. Other times they may not. So I I, I would turn this around into an answer to the mentee, which is. We need to figure out when and how we need to modify regulations <laughs> to move forward with resilience. Yeah, I I know one example. I I don't know if Caitlin is still um, on uh, at the meeting, but during the Ninigrit and uh, Quanchitag projects, wasn't it necessary to get waivers to put dredge material onto the marsh? I see you there, Caitlin. Can you comment on that? Sure. Um. We, we didn't need waivers. They were permitted as restoration projects. So I think we're lucky in Rhode Island in that the, our coastal regulations have broad exemptions for things that are deemed restoration activities. I know that is not necessarily the case, for example, in Massachusetts. So they've had a lot of um, difficulty. I, I don't know that anybody's pursuing any large scale sediment placement in Massachusetts, but I know it's been a challenge and we've been trying to do some information transfer like with regulators to talk about results. But I think Massachusetts is not quite ready um, to permit that kind of activity. So yeah, it's I think it varies state to state. Thanks, and, Caitlin. And Joe, yeah, just that's... one more quick comment from Pam. Uh, most environmental permitting is based on conservation and protection. It's not well suited to serve restoration or creation preservation. Very interesting. So this is this is exactly where we're heading, and I want to thank Marilyn, Marilyn for transitioning into us into the discussion phase, um, because um, what I'm going to ask the group now is sort of having seen the input from others, both on what we need to improve and what actions are needed to ensure that we have adequate information. What are your observations? What questions come up for you? Like the one Marilyn posted. Uh, please put that in the chat. chat. Um, you can also raise your hand if you want to say something um, based upon the input you observed, a question you have, uh, something more you want to talk about with respect to what we need to improve and what actions are needed to ensure we have adequate information. So feel free to put a hand up. Um, and Joan, anything coming up in the chat? Uh, there are a couple of comments that have come in uh, since last time I looked at, and one is from Nicole, monitoring is key to alleviate, alleviate some of these concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, many states are not happy to allow impacts to state bottomlands. Another comment and uh, another one was that timing restrictions made the project difficult. Um, some additional ones, NOAA and MFS is a huge obstacle. Uh, need license to experiment and fail. OK, keep um, we have a few more minutes, so keep putting those uh, chats, uh, chat comments. Um, in Joe, there. I'm, yes. I'm wondering if Martha could uh, could elaborate a little bit on um, the different obstacles that are thrown up. I'm really interested. Martha, you, you could either come on the microphone or type it. Hi. Um, yeah, what we've run into with our shoreline projects is that 
it's that transfer of habitat, bottom land kind of thing. So that NOAA tends to, we have the hardest time with marine fisheries because they, that, that change between bottom land and if you're doing shorelines. And that's just, that's been one of the main issues in New Jersey um, that, you know, NOAA's willingness to allow, you know, you know kind of that trade off. Thanks. Thanks. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Martha. Um, is there any any final thoughts before we move on to some more questions for the group? Anything else that came in the chat? There's one uh, learning that open marsh water management OMWM hurt the marshes led to distrust of new methods that may also have adverse impacts. Mm. Thank you for that. All right, well, I think we're ready to move on um, to to the next uh, couple of open ended prompts. We're really seeking your guidance on a a number of issues that will become important elements of the proceedings. Um, and in this next prompt, it's resilience has been tackled in a variety of ways across regions and organizations. Which aspects should be more standardized versus more tailored? More standardized versus more tailored. And I'll ask you when you put your your um, your thought into Menti, please indicate whether you're speaking about more standardized or more tailored, so we're clear um, what your comments respecting. And um, I will just chime in, Joe, that like we, we actually saw some comments in the earlier open ended mentee of people saying, well, we need to standardize monitoring, for instance. So um, mm -hmm. what things do we think we could standardize and what things are so place specific that um, they really can't be standardized? Give you about 30 seconds to think about this. Thank you for leading off with that great um, example of putting in standard in front, standardized, and I look forward to seeing more of that clarity. That's helpful. Seeing a, a number of uh, standard uh, people suggesting standard standardized um, ecosystem services, a framework for resilience, helping vulnerable vulnerable communities, carbon sequestration. Give you another few seconds to. Pop your ideas. And again, you can put multiple ones if there's no limit here.
Yeah, we saw some tailored ones like um, community awareness, site specific design, um, community benefits related to marsh restoration and resilience. What marsh benefits are priorities for the community? These are all suggested to be tailored. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. If you can just go back up and let people see, if may see a few of the earlier ones, which may give them other thoughts. And uh, Joan, anything in the chat to to mention? Uh, so there was a question from Jen asking if anyone has methods for measuring carbon sequestration that they can share. And it looks like um, there's a um, comment from Kathy, um, I think in response to an earlier comment about open marsh water management, that adding in an experimental aspect, including controls and reference sites to compare the response of a quote novel unquote climate adaptation intervention might help determine the usefulness of a specific action. However, this requires monitoring and, and funding. So those were the, the newest comments. Mm. Thanks, Joan. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, the things are slowing down on the um, standardized versus tailored. And um, I think we're going to move on now to, well, we can just take a quick look at these bottom ones, which I don't know if people saw that Adriana is pointing us to now. Uh, standardizing estimating ecosystem services for coastal flood and storm surge protection. Tailoring, um, there's one above it that tailoring approaches to community resilience based upon specific needs and goals, similar to something we saw earlier. Yeah, thanks. Thank you all. This these are this is really helpful input and um, exactly what we're looking for. So uh, maybe now we'll move on. We have some more input we want to get from you on organizations. Um, how can different organizations coordinate better to fill gaps and share lessons learned? Coordinate better to fill the gaps and share lessons learned. So give you about 30 seconds to think about it and start putting in thoughts. So far we have ramp, which we heard about from a number of our speakers. Um, we need a mid-Atlantic version of SAMC, coordinated site visits, respect each other, um, access to published research. Um, seeing some more come in, I'll give you a few more moments to plug things in. Oh, SASME, not SAMC, sorry about that.
uh, South Bay, South Atlantic Salt Marsh Initiative. And this is interesting. Too many organizations work in isolation and need to coordinate. Um, and lobbying for funding for a regional coordinator. Um, don't limit collaboration to the mid-Atlantic. But a lot about regional and even national coordination. All right. Yeah, if you can scroll back up for folks so you can see what, what else is there. Programs like this one. OK. More about regional collaboration. All right, well. Um, thanks everyone for for yet another very helpful round of inputs on this particular question on organizational coordination. And lessons learned and uh, we're going to now shift into another menti pair. Um, on environmental justice. So which do you see being most important in terms of environmental justice for salt marsh restoration and protection? So go to your mentee and after this we'll have an open ended question related to environmental justice. Okay. Looks like so far prioritizing marshes for restoration that benefit historically overburdened and underrepresented communities. Looks like it's at the top. Identifying who the primary beneficiaries are of restoration and protection for different marshes in my area and quantifying existing potential users of a marsh are about even kind of a second. I'm not seeing anything on recognizing indigenous tribal values and uses of marshes. But it looks like the, the top one is the one you see in pink. And uh, I'll give it just another moment before we move on. All right, so keep these ideas in mind. Uh, these these uh, five different uh, measures or parameters as we move into the the next uh, menti, which is going to be an open ended prompt. Expand on what you chose, um, or was something missing, um, and your view on its importance for environmental justice regarding wetland restoration and protection. So expand on what you chose. Um, and if you if there's something you feel was missing, please put missing at the beginning of your entry. Give you about 30 seconds to get going on this.
there's a few things that people have identified as missing. Um, identifying, training, and empowering DEIJ community leaders. Um, evaluating community needs values more generally. Um, and there were a few, could you just go up for a second? There were a few others that were identified as missing, Adriana. Just a little bit higher. Um, yeah, ensure, ensure policies are in place that greening of neighborhood with natural features does not displace low income, ensuring it does not displace low income uh, housing and need to see some lessons learned from projects that have prioritized EJ in wetland restoration. Give folks a, another few moments to add additional thoughts. Again, feel free to put them in more than one, and this is really important to us because we we definitely want to know um, a little bit more nuance on what you chose in the prior mentee, and and also what you think is missing was missing and is important. Important. Pam has made a comment in the chat, Joe. Three comments link, link tribal to underserved instead of them being separate on the prior mentee. Thanks, Joan. Hmm. Well, this is uh, this has been great. Uh, these are wonderful um, amplifications of your um, responses to the prior mentee, and also a very helpful identification of things that, that are missing. Um, I think this is a good time to move forward with um, kind of towards our wrap up. And um, I just let me I'll speak for myself for a moment and just say. Um, it's been a pleasure to be part of this over the last two days. Um, the planning committee, the folks who worked to put this together um, were amazing. Uh, there were a lot of thought went into uh, both the substance and the process of how to make a two day workshop virtually um, successful. Um, and um, and the goal was to get a lot of information out to you through the speakers and then receive a lot of information from you. And I think that's uh, precisely what what was accomplished here. Um, I certainly learned a lot from the speakers, amazing wealth of information. Um, and, and I also learned a lot from the earnest remarks that were put into the mentees and the and the chat. And uh, it's been really terrific. So I'm going to turn it over now um, for the final wrap up uh, and to, to Jordan and um, and just as we're doing that, just want you to know that we have a few anonymous polls. Um, and Jordan, should I run the, we should run the polls first before you uh, give some final remarks? Okay. Yes, so, thank you, Jordan. Um, so the first poll is going to be uh, rating your satisfaction with the content. And again, this is anonymous. So we'll give you a minute or two to do that. And you'll see you can there's a scale from not very good to excellent um, for each of four different uh, areas. And this feedback is very helpful to us. Um, there already were some calls for an annual conference like this or more conferences like this. So 
whomever does any future conferences will benefit from from this kind of feedback. So thank you. Are we ready to move on to the next um, anonymous poll? Yes, that would be great. Did we miss 26, Adriana? Oh, I'm just checking. Sorry. Here is, oh, do I need to? Yes, sorry about that. All right, 26, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thanks for going, thanks for going back. So this one is on the content um, as opposed to more of the process. And again, this feedback is, is really very helpful and thank you for see the numbers are going up and we really appreciate the, the feedback. Give it another few moments to finish up. OK, I think we'll move now on to the next one, Adriana, which is a, an open ended, also anonymous, but open ended prompt. Um, did the workshop meet your expectations? Why or why not? What are your suggestions for improvement? Again, anonymous um, and we would really value your your thoughts here. And this is the one where we're, we're going to go ahead with the um wrap up and this prompt will be open throughout my wrap up and for at least 15 minutes after the workshop. So I'm going to go ahead in the interest of um, people's time and just wrap us up. 